Good evening. My name is Betsy Stites, and I'm the president of the Woodbury Cottage Grove League of Women Voters, and I am really pleased to welcome you this evening uh, to another public event. We have a wonderful program, uh, and we'll get to hear from Jason Posel, our new, what? well, he's not new, he's been here a year now, I think, um, our uh, Woodbury Safety Director, and Vivian's going to introduce him. But first, I just wanted always at the beginning of any of our meetings to reinforce uh, our mission and vision and values. Um, we are a, an organization that empowers voters and defends democracy. We envision a democracy where every person has the desire, the right, the knowledge, and the confidence to participate. We believe in the power of women and men to create a more perfect democracy. And I always like to really uh, reinforce the importance of our nonpartisan uh, statement and stance. The League is nonpartisan, neither supporting nor opposing candidates or political parties at any level of government, but always working on vital issues of concern to members and the public. And again, we are really thrilled to have Jason Posel with us. And I'm going to turn it over to Vivian Tannehill, who's going to be our moderator tonight. Who's Vivian, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Betsy. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I met tonight's guest through a series of emails from a mutual friend, Carlo Montgomery. And he offered to meet with me at any time that I wanted to, to talk more about the police force. So we met over coffee last summer and we had a very enlightening conversation, which brings us to tonight's event. So I'm, it is my pleasure to introduce Woodbury's police uh, public safety director, Jason Posel, who was promoted to the director role in August 22, and after serving 25 years on the Woodbury Police Force. And um, Director Posel served in a number of roles, including community service officer, police officer, patrol sergeant, and patrol commander, where he oversaw patrol divisions, the SWAT teams, K-9 units, and community engagement. So welcome, Director Posel. Thank so you very much. We'll go into the first question and hear more about you. Director, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, what inspired you to become a safety officer, and how you came to be um, part of the Whitbury Police Department? Yeah, thank you for that introduction and uh, hello to everyone. Uh, yeah, so I um, grew up in the east side of St. Paul, um, got involved early on um, in terms of looking at service and thinking about how we, um, you know, as I look towards a profession, um, what those opportunities were to serve the, the larger community. Uh, my first touch point with that was, um, was the Scouts and a Boy Scout um, looking at uh, how we provide service to the community. And, you know, that really kind of rolled into a program called the Explorer Program. That's a law enforcement Explorer Program, giving youth opportunities to um, connect with law enforcement. Um, it's a uniform position. It is volunteer, but um, it's an opportunity to be a part of different events, conduct ride-alongs, and I'm really looking at how, you know, uh, I'm a big kind of pond and a, uh, a pebble in a, in a pond kind of person. I, you know, you drop the pebble in the pond and those ripple impacts. And from a service um, standpoint, that was really important to me to have um, a career of impact, to have a life of impact and, and helping other people and creating those positive ripples um, through the community. So that's kind of how my earliest um, touch point. I was also had a, a St. Paul police uh, canine handler came in and did a demonstration um, when I was in fifth grade. And, and I think that also was pretty um, impactful to me as well. As I've kind of moved through my career, I um, look for other volunteer opportunities with uh, the North St. Paul Police Department as a, as a police reserve there, another volunteer position. 
uh, before coming to Woodbury as a community service officer. Um, that's a paid position, entry level position um, here in the organization. And um, since then, yeah, I've, I've uh, you mentioned a lot of things that I've been uh, fortunate enough to be involved in. Um, now as the director of public safety, I oversee our police divisions, our EMS divisions, and our emergency management divisions. I also sit on the uh, board for the open cupboard food shelf. Um, which is just located just across the interstate here in Oakdale and uh, have been a volunteer for there for many years as well. So that's a little bit about me and uh, kind of how I've came to uh, to be with you all tonight. Great. Thank you so much. I'm going to continue with the questions. Can you tell us about the department that you inherited from the retiring safety director and police chief? And what changes did you make immediately and what things have you left in place and why? Yeah, so the uh, the great thing with the partial of uh, uh, former director Lee Vag is um, this wasn't a fixer upper. It was a, uh, I would say it was more turnkey ready to use the uh, um, some uh, house buying vernacular. Um, but, you know, uh, stepping into this role, um, it's been a long, um, it's been a his organization with a long history of a good culture within the organization. Um, we have good people who work here. Um, we hire people who um, have a servant heart and they come here to um, you know, provide service to the community. I've worked here since 1996 and I've still yet to produce a product. I mean, we are in the service industry. Um, we provide a service to the community. So, you know, we really look for um, folks who have that servant's heart. Um, you know, in terms of some of the key things that um, we're looking to continue to enhance would have been um, certainly our recruitment efforts. Um, it's no um, surprise if you're if you're watching the news in terms of what the struggles have been in, um, in policing over the last several years um, related to um, finding people who um, are interested in doing this work. So that was really an effort um, right off the bat was really to bolster our efforts. Um, you know, there's a couple different kind of pathways that we um, that we pursued that we wanted to bolster. One of them was what we call a pathway program. That's for um, people who are interested in law enforcement, uh, might be interested in law enforcement and, and using kind of that same career um, trajectory that I talked about a little bit for myself in terms of our Explorer program. Um, our volunteer reserve program, um, getting folks involved in our community service officer program and giving them opportunities um, to try on the organization. Um, that was a big effort um, early on in terms of, um, we also, from a recruitment standpoint, looked at our folks who were just finishing up with school um, and having a specific recruitment strategy um, along with our laterals as well, people who are uh, work for other departments um, who, who are looking to maybe make a shift. Um, so developing a recruitment team and really focusing on those three different areas from a recruitment perspective. Um, one of the things that I did not want to change um, and that we haven't changed is, and I hit on it a little bit ago, which is the culture of the organization. Um, you know, we are a mission-based organization. Um, our mission here is that we serve all with compassion and courage. Um, we provide service by living through our values, which is integrity, trust, respect, and excellence. And really weaving our mission and our values throughout all of our training, through our um, recruitment process, making sure that people know who might be interested in our organization. Here's who we are. Here's what we value. Here's what the mission is of our organization. And um, if that's not where they're at, um, and that isn't, um, then then they're not. It's not going to work out for them here. And um, through our process of hiring, that's one of the things that we. Um, really look for, not just from an interview standpoint, but we also have um, people coming in, go through um, different scenarios. One is which they are talking to uh, a, a role player who's experiencing um, a mental health crisis and their ability to um, connect with that person, um, their ability to be empathetic towards them. Um, we also look for um, those same type of traits in another scenario we do, which is a, a verbal domestic, um, a dispute between uh, between a couple and they walk in and we really look for them to step into that role and again, provide that empathy um, and as they listen to the story, really trying to kind of connect with what the solutions are, not just kind of the Band-Aid, but the more of those long-term things and, and connecting people to resources, which is really a big part of what we do 
um, in policing is connecting people to resources and really see that as a major function of the organization and of our work here. Great. Thank you, Jason. Um, you talked a little bit about your mission, but can you share with us your vision for the safety, the, pu the public safety department under your guidance and direction? Yeah, our vision, um, you know, really our, our path forward is um, really living through our mission, you know, living, um, you know, through our values and making sure that we maintain our focus on what our mission is, is here. Um, and again, a lot of that is connecting um, folks to resources. Um, you know, we deal with um, and interact with folks in their worst day. I mean, nobody calls the police when they're having a good day or when things are going well. You know, we get called in um, when there is a problem and there is a need for assistance. And, you know, we really, um, our values of integrity, trust, respect, and excellence, um, really weaving those not only throughout our recruitment process, but also from our ongoing training as well. And, um, you know, really looking for opportunities to, um, you know, find great work that's being done in the community. You know, I talk about compassion and courage as part of our mission statement. Um, we have a annual awards and recognition event, um, which is actually taking place next week. And what we do is we look for opportunities to highlight good work that's being done. And the vision of the organization is to continue to really build upon our culture um, that we have here. I love the saying that, um, you know, uh, culture eats policy for breakfast. And, you know, that culture is to an organization um, what a personality is to a person. And, you know, our culture within our organization, our vision that, of the work that we do here is, is just that. It's, it's living through our, um, through our values and then making sure that um, we're, you know, making, uh, not only highlighting the good work that's done, um, but really making sure that we're also getting the employees involved and looking for ways that, that we can get better. And, and I would say one more thing, you know, from a organization standpoint, um, you know, I see this as a learning organization. I'm, um, I'm a lifelong learner. Our rest of our command staff prides ourselves on being lifelong learners. And as an organization, we're continually striving for opportunities to, to get better. And that's not just ideas that we come up with, but that's also um, working with the community to see what areas that we can continue to improve in. Great, thank you so much. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit here and ask you, what challenges have you seen related to policing, community relations, and race relations before and after the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis? Yeah, so some of the uh, the trends that you know we've seen in terms of things over the last couple of years, I mean, certainly mental health calls have um, continued to um, uh, skyrocket and in response to that, um, really honing in on how we can work with our community partners and work with our um, government agencies. We brought in a full-time social worker who is embedded into our department. We have a full-time detective who works in that in a plain clothes, um, plain clothes assignment. We brought in a, a therapy dog as well, um, which accompanies them on many of their visits as well. And we're looking at um, continuing to build that program. Um, and this is a program that it's not just going to when there's a, a mental health crisis, but a situation where maybe there has been previous contacts and we're looking at interacting with this individual or their family to build that relationship and trust um, during a non-crisis moment and getting those, drawing those um, building those relationships up in the event that it, when there is a problem, um, hopefully if it's identified early that um, they're going to be reaching out to us and we'll be able to go out interact with them maybe before it gets to that kind of crisis point. So um, that folk, uh, the community support team's focus is on, um, uh, on community mental um, crisis. Um, they're for substance abuse and also homelessness is their major um, area of, of focus. And um, we're, like I said, we're looking at continuing to, to add to that. In terms of, you know, kind of uh, going back in time a little bit to 2019, um, as it relates to um, relationships with underserved um, community groups. Uh, you know, I, I think about a, a contact I had 
with Ann Olawasandi. Ann is a uh, cashier for Jerry's Foods here in Woodbury. And she reached out to me and uh, told me a story in February 2019 of an interaction that her grandson had had with the Woodbury Police Department. And he had been stopped, a uh, traffic stop, and had come home and was shaking and was crying. And Ann shared with me that it was a really um, traumatic event for her son. Um, as she just kind of described what took place, it, it, as I was hearing it, it sounded like what a lot of police officers would consider a routine traffic stop, um, but very impactful to this young man um, who really kind of had a fight or flight moment when he was being pulled over. And um, Anne really shared with me the fear that was involved in this in this contact. And, and in our conversation, it was clear that the officer and her grandson had had two very different experiences in the same context, the same the same contact that they had together, and you know really got us thinking about. Um, Ann and I were kind of brainstorming of like, well, how do you know how do we improve this? How do we continue to um, or, or move forward so that you know her the officers can have a better perspective of what her grandson might be going through in this in this encounter. And then her grandson might have more um, understanding and, and maybe can develop some comfortability about what this interaction um, really could look like or, or you know, is designed to look like. And um, it was the forming of our multicultural advisory committee, um, which we started, um, we started working on right away. So that was February 2019. We have uh, 20 members as part of our committee. Um, we meet once a month. We talk about equipment, we talk about training, we talk about recruitment. Um, it really is kind of an opportunity to um, continue to build a trust and relationship in the community. Kind of moving through having that committee in place. And then we think about the murder of George Floyd. And then ultimately, you know, the conversations. Um, we had had that a good foundation with the group um, as we'd been working on it again since February 2019. Um, you know, once once that took place, um, there were a lot of difficult conversations, not just with this group, but ac across the country as well. But, um, you know, in terms of how policing and how our work here has continued to evolve over that time, um, we've really focused on, you know, developing those relationships, um, developing and building upon that trust, um, both before, during, and, and after. And, you know, our our um, you know, kind of what I really stress with our entire staff, not just our police officers, but also our EMS fire folks, as well as, you know, we're really focusing on each interaction and how important each interaction that we have um, in the community. And, you know, we can do a thousand different community events, um, but, you know, we, we think about the 40,000 calls for service that we take and the thousands and thousands of traffic um, stops that take place throughout the course of each year. And um, if we're not, you know, living through our values and um, and our mission and focusing in on having positive interactions at each one of those, each one of those interactions, um, we're not we're not serving the community the way that we should be. So we really have an emphasis on on that service component. And again, kind of weave that throughout the course of, of all of our training. Great, thank you. So you've talked about an, <clears throat> excuse me, a number of different things. Can you, because when you and I sat down and talked, you shared with me a lot of different programs that I didn't expect to find in the the area that you work in, um, the safety department. So you've touched a little bit about your relationship with the community, but can you expand on that a little bit and talk about some of the other programs that you have going? Yeah, so we have a, um, a number of programs that here in the public safety department, um, I would say internally, we have um, some things that I would highlight is um, we formed a BIPOC support group for our officers and for our entire staff here, knowing that, uh, you know, folks, um, our BIPOC community who works within public safety um, face unique challenges um, in the work and I'm really looking for opportunities to provide support. Um, for that group. We also have a, um, we call a female forum. This is a, a group of all of our, um, our women officers who work for the organization who come together 
um, to talk about the unique challenges that they face and training opportunities that, that are available to them. Um, from a recruitment perspective, um, I've, I talked, I've talked quite a bit about that, um, but I would, you know, kind of highlighting our internal processes. We also have um, an annual mental health um, check that's required for all of our staff um, once a year. Um, not only do they go through that one year um, check in, they also then are provided five additional visits for free throughout the course of the year. And that's available to them and their spouse um, or family, kind of depending on what dynamics they have. I mean, it's a stressful job that mm -hmm. that we all have here. And, um, you know, having those opportunities to make sure that we're processing that, um, the things that we see here um, is really important and um, is a focal area that we have in the organization. That's kind of some of our internal pieces. You know, I've talked about our community support team and Otis, our therapy dog, who uh, who does a lot of great work in the community with engagement and the ability to, to kind of go out and interact and investigations and things like that. But I would also highlight he's really an important member of our team as well. Um, he's here at the public safety building and uh, we all get an opportunity to interact with him each day. So those are some of our internal pieces from an external perspective. And we have a lot of um, Things that we're working, I would say that you know it is a finite resource in terms of our ability to um, conduct community engagement overall, and and we're we work to be really intentional with those um, with those resources, uh, making sure that you know we really have a, a a focal area of reaching out to our our BIPOC communities, any of our underserved communities, and uh, our lower income folks as well. So we're conducting. Um, summer barbecues throughout the summer where we're going out to low-income housing units. Um, we partner with Open Cupboard. They provide the food. Um, it's an opportunity in, in, uh, in a relaxed setting um, to interact with folks and to have them uh, have the opportunity to come up and, and ask us questions and, um, and also is a good connection to the Open Cupboard. Um, resources as well. So we look at moving that around to different lower income uh, communities throughout the, or uh, uh, facilities throughout the course of the summer. Um, you know, we do a lot of events that are just kind of events that, you know, um, national night out and, you know, a lot of the, the ones that you've probably, you know, shop with the cop. Um, and, and those are, those are important, but um, I really, the things that that we do in terms of really being intentional with those resources and getting out in the community um, are some of the things that uh, that I'm certainly most proud of that our organization is involved in. Great. And I remember seeing you at Juneteenth as well yeah. and your support animal there. So I'm going to um, talk about or ask you a question about um, firearms. We recently, within the League of Women Voters Minnesota, did a an update on our position about firearms. And so that kind of raised to the to the top of the, the questions for us as a league. And so some of our members expressed a real interest in knowing what are you doing about the proliferation of firearms and firearm violence here in Woodbury? Yeah, this is a... Uh... Uh, but you know, you turn on the news, and and this is um, this is you can't miss it. So you know, in terms of the gun violence that's that's been occurring in the community, um, you know, it's some of the things that we've been focusing in on specifically is this uh, safe storage of firearms. Um, you know, we we partnered with uh, Moms Demand Action and their program Be Smart, um, which is a program focused on proper and safe storage of and handling of firearms. Um, we at the public at, at the police department here, um, I personally sign off on all of the permits to purchase. Um, the permits to carry are signed off on by the the sheriff um, at Washington County, but all of the permits to purchase come through me and I sign off on those. Anytime somebody comes in for a permit to purchase, um, it, you know we're conducting a background check. Um, we provide them information on the Be Smart program. We offer them gun safety locks as well. Um, we're also involved in the kind of co-ownership of the Hero Center, which is a um, training center located down in Cottage Grove. And um, as part of that, um, it's not only a law enforcement training program, but it's also open to the public as well. And they regularly hold firearms training classes, safety classes, 
um, through their organization. So we, you know, kind of weave the Be Smart program through that, through our training that we do um, at that uh, at that facility as well. From a program standpoint, from as as relates to community engagement, uh, we like to regularly bring that um, information with to our different events and uh, make sure that people um, are thinking about these things um, as they're uh, as they're thinking about purchasing firearms. We do have, you know, it's not just the uh, the ownership piece, but, you know, storage is really a big component of this is how how these guns are falling into the hands of of some of our young people. And some of that is a result of, you know, theft from motor vehicles or burglaries, um, kind of how people end up with guns. So we really um, focus in on that safe storage and se secure storage to to do what we can to reduce the number of guns that are out in the community. Great, thank you. That's um, I think that's that's very helpful information. So we, you talked about crime, and you know we always hear these numbers flying up and down about how um, crime is on the rise and things of that nature. And I'd like to do like a temperature check to find out, you know, what is our crime rate here in the city of Woodbury, and how does that compare with? the larger or other cities in Minnesota, and then the national crime rate itself. How are we doing in terms of crime in our area? Yeah, so, uh, you know, crime is an interesting topic um, because there's a number of different ways that it can kind of be talked about. And, you know, I don't, um, I, I like the contextualized discussion as it relates to the reality of, of Woodbury specifically. And, you know, we really look at our per capita data for that information. As the community continues to grow, uh, you would expect to see calls for service continue to grow with that um, proportionally as well. I mean, certainly we're going to have more crime here in Woodbury than Bayport's going to have, for example. But for that, if you look historically through Woodbury, looking at that per capita data, that one per 1,000 data, it's remained re relatively level throughout time. Um, as we continue to add people, we're, you know, we're going to see some inclines over time proportional to that population growth. Um, so that's been pretty consistent. So I, you know, in terms of like these big spikes that, that are being talked about, um, we're not seeing those in Woodbury on that per capita. As you start to break down specific types of crimes, um, that's where you can see some increases and decreases in some specific areas. For example, in 2020, we had zero um, carjackings. In 2021, we had one carjacking. In 2022, we had three carjackings. Well, while these are still you know, relatively low occurrence items in the city, each one of these events has a huge community impact if you're following social media at all and you're looking at any of the neighborhood um, you know, groups that are involved, I mean, these it really has a ripple effect through the entire community anytime something like this happens in the city. So, well, again, while it's a relatively low number, it has a high community impact. So that's something that we've um, we've seen in terms of um, you know, some increases in some specific areas, um, like burglaries, for example. We've seen some um, some slight increases with that. Um, theft, because we're such a you know, retail hub in this area that, um, you know, we have, uh, we do see um, quite a bit of retail related crime. I mean, I say quite a bit, but it's really relative to, you know, again, that kind of per capita and the more businesses we bring in, the more you would expect to see some of those numbers go up. So, yeah, while we're nationally, um, you know, it can look different in different areas, you know, cities versus suburbs versus rural areas. Um, I would say from uh, maybe my short answer would be that per capita wise, we're, we haven't seen any um, huge increases um, here in Woodbury. Okay. Um, so how does that compare to the national crime rate? Are we in the ballpark? Are we high, low, mid-range? Oh. Yeah, we fall, um, we fall kind of mid-range in terms of what um, suburb cities are, you know, uh, kind of connected to larger metropolitan cities. Uh, we kind of fall in, in with that group in terms of, um, but it's so specific to different regional areas in terms of 
Um, you know, whether you're more of that kind of bedroom community, which, you know, people go to work into the city and then they come out into the suburb and, you know, that's, but they do most of their shopping and, um, you know, their business interactions are taking place and their restauranting is happening inside the city. There are some cities that, um, you know, where those suburbs have a, a higher retail presence, a higher, um, you know, business re retail restaurant um, type um, design. So it's it's kind of hard to talk apples and apples as it relates to, um, you know, crime specific to suburban areas, because it really depends on the suburban area that you're referring to the proximity to a larger a metropolitan city. But, you know, again, our per capita number, um, thankfully, has, has remained um, relatively, uh, has remained relatively level over the over the last several years. Great. Thank you for your patience with me on that question. Question. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what's going on in other cities and the violence associated with the recent Scorpion unit in Memphis, you know, it really has caught the attention of the media and the people of our nation. And I'm curious about whether Woodbury has units similar to the Scorpion unit uh, that they had in Memphis. And what made you decide to or not to go in that direction and have those types of units here in Woodbury? Yeah, so when I uh, had never heard of the Scorpion unit before the uh, the events in Memphis um, were highlighted. And, you know, my first thought when I heard it is who names a unit the Scorpion unit was my first thought. Um, and it really, from a culture standpoint, it hit me um, funny, not funny, but it hit me in a, in a bad spot right away because really from a culture standpoint, who you are as a department and who you are as a specific specialty unit, um, you can tie a lot of that back to the identity of the group and the culture within that within that subgroup um, that can develop if, if you're not careful. So um, we do not have a scorpion unit. Um, we don't have anything that looks like a scorpion unit. Um, we have a community support team and um, we've really focused our efforts on, um, again, kind of connecting people to resources and really having a unit that amplifies the work that we're trying to do overall. Um, and again, that that area is, you know, focusing on, um, you know, mental health, community mental health, homelessness, and substance abuse, and really looking to connect people to resources at times when it's not in crisis, uh, building that trust and relationship. So yeah, we don't, we don't have anything that, that looks like that. Um, and um, I, I, we, I don't, we wouldn't um, just because that's from a culture standpoint, our organization, um, you know, the, if, if somebody suggested a, a unit that, that um, operated like that, um, it would be a, it would be a hard no right away. So um, I think the short answer is uh, we do not have um, a unit that looks like that. And uh, it, it really, uh, it kind of um, was alarming to me to learn. The, the more I learned about the unit, the more alarmed I was about it. Great. Well, thank you for not, for making the decision not to go in that direction. I think we all um, value and appreciate that. So you talked a little bit about mental health and embedding someone within the units. Can you expand on that a little bit more and tell us what 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 you're doing as a um, department and your philosophy around how you handle situations where there are mental health episodes? Yeah. So what um, what we really our least favorite um, our least preferred way to respond to a mental health crisis is for this to be the first interaction that we've had with that individual or with that family. Um, you know, if that's the case, you know, trust cannot be really high. Um, you know, it's hard to form relationships in crisis in terms of, um, you know, connecting with both the individual and with the family. So the community support team was really born out of the idea that, um, and this was a, a model that had been developed out in California. We actually send um, some of our people out to California um, to ride with their um um, ride with their different units and learn more about them. But it's really the idea of, um, you know, that the the police officers themselves, um, you know, while they play an important role, there's also other support that can be 
um, and resources that that we can work to connect people with to help keep them on track so that we don't we hopefully can reduce some of those crisis calls. And these crisis calls are not only difficult for the individual, for the family, but it's also really difficult for our staff as well. I mean, these are um, situations where, you know, you're being called, somebody called 911, it's, you know, it, it's already a crisis. It's something that that likely is already out of control. Um, and when you're dealing with, when you're um, going to those calls and interacting with people that are in that headspace, um, it's really it's really dangerous for everyone involved, um, including for our staff. So really the the idea of, was born out of, you know, what would it look like if we had um, better relationships and we could build that trust with individuals um, and their families in order to give us a call if something was was maybe starting to head down that path. Somebody had just stopped taking their medication. Um, somebody had just started, um, you know, acting unusual or kind of falling back into some old habits. Um, so that's really was kind of the the um, the genesis of the of the program overall. Um, we really, it's really been a success by any measure. We've had um, you know a lot of um, interactions where, you know, if there has been a something that has developed into a crisis situation, having the ability to have our community support team members reach out to the family to better coordinate even our response, um, to talk to an individual who, who we've already had um, a relationship with and, and have talked to and provided resources. And, and really, I think viewing that as more of a partnership as we work through that. Um, we have, um, as I mentioned, um, a full-time embedded social worker in, here at the department. Um, she works, Angie Shackleton is her name. She is a Washington County social services um, employee who's embedded here. So we um, we pay for uh, the bulk of her salary and we have that budgeted. Um, we're also looking for some grants right now to potentially add another Angie Shackleton, another um, social worker as we've really seen the value um, that she can bring for us. Um, and then that um, co-response with, uh, with Adam Sack, who's I'm our detective who's assigned to that unit. And then, uh, as I mentioned, also um, Otis as well, our, uh, our English golden retriever who uh, who gets to go out and uh, and interact with people as well is, is really a great, uh, for folks who enjoy dogs, uh, it really is a great kind of conduit. Um, it's so he's been, uh, he's been really helpful and in, in not only in our investigative work, but also in, in those community interactions and community engagement events. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is a program that we're not only looking at um, adding uh, additional social workers, we're also looking at what type of administrative help we can provide for them, um, how many more officers we should assign to the unit. So we're kind of in evaluation phase right now to determine what's the right amount of um, folks in that based on the workload that we have. Um, I'm getting a, we're, I'm going to get a little ahead of myself, but one of the things that we're really um, excited about right now is we look to continue to expand that program as our opportunities to interact with um, victims of domestic assaults and um, develop those relationships and trust um, with folks who've been experiencing um, domestic um, abuse, domestic assaults. Um, create those connections during those non-crisis times, develop those relationships, and uh, really work to get people connected to resources. Um, so again, it's not just that um, if it's an ongoing situation, um, we have that relationship and that trust built up. And, and you know, a, a lot of that happens during those non-crisis times. Um, so that's something that we're, we're kind of excited, we're very excited about um, developing here in the near future. Great. So um, I want to move on to something else. And it, every once in a while, we hear something on the news about a person involved with a high-speed chase. And it ends up oftentimes with someone outside of that um, vehicle that's being chased, injuring somebody else or somebody's home being run into and other types of trauma in the community. So what is our policy and practice around high-speed chases in Woodbury? 
Yeah, so th this is an area that we've had to, to really examine over the last year. Um, we've seen um, some significant increases in stolen vehicles. You know, if, uh, you've probably seen um, related to Kias is one specifically where they were more easily able to, to get those vehicles started. Um, so we've seen an increase in stolen vehicles. Uh, with that, we, we see a lot of um, when we, at the end of those pursuits and through our follow-up and investigations, oftentimes it's kids um, who are involved in this. So, you know, you have, um, you know, a kid who, who is likely an inexperienced driver um, driving a vehicle that does not belong to them, who they're not familiar with, um, driving at high rates of speed. And, uh, you know, our, our policy, um, I would say, was pretty um, flexible in terms of providing a lot of, um, you know, we had some specific parameters in terms of what um, things officers should be considering during these pursuits. Um, we have bolstered up and are bolstering up our our supervision of those pursuits. Um, you know, if you think about all of the things that are going on inside of a patrol car, when you have a car that's not stopping for you, once you've activated your lights and sirens, you have um, the lights and sirens, which is an auditory and visual draw on your, you know, kind of mental capacity. You've got, um, you've got the radio, so you're radioing out information, um, you've got to make sure you're not too close, not too far from the vehicle that you're pursuing. You've got intersections that you're coming up to. You're trying to coordinate different resources, come into the area. Maybe that's stop sticks. Maybe that's a helicopter. So the officer in those situations is really op operating in pretty full capacity. And their ability to, you know, reason through the um, some of the priorities as it relates to, you know, the seriousness of the offense um, you know, while, while they do a great job with this, it, it's just a lot. And, and I've been in pursuits myself and, um, know that that draw on all of that kind of mental capacity. So what we're really looking at doing is, is further bolstering the supervision of those and having, um, a supervisor who's not involved in the pursuit, more proactively asking questions to make sure that the severity of the fence is such that, you know, it's worth the risk of the community um, that this that this person is, um, you know, um, is what that looks like. And some of that relates to the speed in which they're traveling. Um, some of it relates to their driving behavior. But we really want to make sure from a severity of the offense that um, it's, it's at a point that's requisite that um, this is something that um, warrants the continuation of the pursuit. Uh, we have never terminated more pursuits, stopped, called off more pursuits than we have over the last year. Uh, we have supervisors that are much more involved as we've um, continued to move in that direction of, of really weighing that community safety piece um, at, at a, such a high level. Um, and then really thinking about what the um, what ultimately the person you're pursuing, while you may never really know um, our experience over the last a um, couple of years with with seeing more and more juveniles in stolen vehicles. So it is a balance um, that you try to achieve. I mean, you know, the other side of the coin is, you know, the less by not being involved in those pursuits, you know, are you a further emboldening people to just not stop for the police, therefore continuing to flee from police. So, you know, we're trying to kind of weigh that out based on kind of what we're what our officers are seeing out in the street. Right now, we're seeing a lot more juveniles involved in stolen cars. And with that, we want to just be really mindful that um, this is going to, you know, this is, you know, that the information that we have that's known at the time that we're at that um, higher severity of level, um, severity of offense level, so that uh, we feel more comfortable with continuing to, to push those. Thank you. That that um, is an excellent response to the question. Now, you and I talked about this when we met, and um, I, I shared with you that I've noticed that when people are stopped for traffic offenses in East Woodbury, that's over by me, that sometimes there's four or five police cars that respond. And I'd like to ask, well, why do you have so many police officers respond to a simple traffic stop? And what 
what is done to keep these stops um, or stops from, of this nature from escalating into something beyond what we want to see? Yeah, so the you know the reason why there can be more than than one car is it really varies. I mean, you know, there's it's pretty typical to have um, a secondary car show up um, just to check on the, the the primary officer who conducted the stop. Sometimes that can look like a third car showing up, but when you're getting beyond that, where you're getting, you know, you're seeing a fourth or a fifth car at a traffic stop, that usually in, in, indicates a higher level of severity with the offense, you know, with the uh, with maybe not only the reason for the initial stop, but information that was developed once the stop took place. Um, so that's that's typically why you'll see uh, more folks show up. You know, we what we really focus on with our officers is not duplicating efforts, but the more people that show up, the more kind of options there are. You know, if you think about if you are the one person who stopped a vehicle and there's the potential, you know, maybe there's something that a, a crime alert is on your computer showing that this car was involved in gun violence. Um, there's a notice on there that maybe somebody in, uh, on your computer that somebody in the vehicle has a warrant for their arrest. I mean, if you're one officer, you know, having your um, your your primary, you know, because you don't have any kind of alternatives from a from a response to resistance or use of force, um, you know, might be the firearm. So you you have a firearm. Well, as the second car comes, as a third car comes, it's really looking for opportunities to to look at what our other options are if something were to happen, if the person were to come out with a knife, if the person were to come out um, and charge the officers, the person took off running from the officers, you know, kind of what all those different variables can look like. So by adding extra officers onto some of those um, higher risk traffic stops, it really allows us to provide more options um, on scene. And that might look like a taser, that might look like a pepper ball, that might look like um, some other type of less lethal um, deployment that, that might be available. So it's not just firearms, it really expands our options on, on how to do that. Now, in terms of how we focus on making sure that, um, you know, as we add more people to those environments that, that we're being, um, that we're making sure that we're doing just that, um, that really comes down to our training. And it's not just our, Initial training, we have officers when they start here, they go through a three month uh, field training officer program where they'll ride with another officer. Um, during that time, um, they'll also go through our academy as well. So officers will go through a, a month long academy where they'll go through scenario based trainings. We also down at the Hero Center from an ongoing training perspective, we have what we call a simulator room where you go in and you have uh, kind of a full, um, nearly 360 um, degree environment where you're interacting with people on the screens and going through different scenarios. We also do a lot of reality-based training where we have role players who are involved. Um, we'll do traffic stops, we'll do um, you know different types of calls at houses, which we have um, down at the Hero Center as well as to replicate that experience. But really, our training focuses on making sure um, that we are, you know, we call it looking for work, which is looking for something that will be helpful in this specific encounter um, that isn't already being utilized and really making sure that we're getting those options out and communicating that out with our partners as well. Great. Well, you know, it's really helpful to have had this conversation with you because it provides so much information, not only to me, but to other members of the community who are looking at this video now or looking at the webinar now, but who might um, chance on our website and do a little bit more exploring about what goes on with our safety department here in Woodbury. So, you know, I've had an opportunity to encounter you on several occasions, sitting down and just having a conversation with you over coffee, uh, meeting you at Juneteenth, seeing you from afar a and kind of taking a wave. And in my, my, my experiences with you have been more than pleasant. So um, I want you to send our audience away 
with some important messages that you would like them to take with them in the same way that I took away a really positive message when you and I had our coffee time. Um, what things would you tell our members that you really want them to know about you, about the department that you, you um, direct and guide, and what things they can take away this evening that they can share with others about you and the um, public safety department. Yeah, thank you for that question. I, you know, I really focus, I, I love the idea of a learning organization. Um, I love the idea that um, us as leaders, us as officers, that we're continually, you know, there never is a goal line that's crossed. It's always out of reach. It's always um, it's always a journey. It's never the ultimate destination. And, and with that, um, not only, and I chatted a lot about our, our, our training, but that training, you know, we isn't just how to use different pieces of equipment or the tactics involved in it. It's also about the understanding of, you know, what these interactions, how these interactions are different from our perspective and then the community's perspective as well. One of the things that, uh, we've been working on over the last couple of years is what we call courageous conversations. And it's uh, facilitated conversations with a community facilitator who's come in to talk about, you know, what, how these, you know, your perception of, of, of when you walk into the room versus what other people's perceptions, you know, some of the historical traumas that have taken place, you know, some of the the stories that get passed down from from uh, decades ago, but that are still very real for um, for community members and community groups, and understanding that you know it's not you personally, but it may just be you know the the work that you do, the the some of the historical trauma and the historical pieces that maybe you were never involved in um, or weren't involved in, but ultimately that kind of ripple through. Um, through community members and um, and through community groups. So, you know, a learning organization, learning at how we um, how we can get better. You know, again, we provide a service to the community. We exist only to provide a service. That's that's the reason why we're here. Um, and seeing how we can do that better, and how you know, I, I always love the uh, the platinum standard. You know, the gold standard is treat other people how you want to be treated, and the platinum standard is treat people how they want to be treated. And, you know, really learning at how we do that better, how from a, that platinum theory, how do we treat people the way that they want to be treated? How do we, um, you know, look for opportunities to slow things down, to try to gain better understanding, to really uh, making sure that we're being empathetic in situations where we may not understand, you know, the perspectives from, from individuals, but, um, you know, how we can really kind of work to gain that perspective. Um, one of the things that we're doing, that we're working on right now that I'm really proud of is a cultural competency video. We have, um, through our multicultural advisory committee, one of the suggestions came up, or the questions rather, was, well, how are you bringing new staff on, like, how, how does new staff get trained in terms of what the demographics are of Woodbury, what some of the nuances are from a cultural perspective, um, that differ from that differ from different community groups. Um, so one of the things that we're working on right now with the cable commission is a um, discussion about different community groups, um, what their historical interactions with the police have been, what some of the cultural norms are that may impact the service that we provide them, and really looking and educating what the demographics of the city are. We have. Um, right now, we are just under 30% of people of color in our community. Um, and if you go under 18, that um, census information is at 40%. So, you know, what are those groups? Um, what, what, what information would be helpful to our staff to not only understand the demographics of the city, but then also, then again, what some of the cultural norms and, and some of those um, perspectives of law enforcement might might be from different community groups. So, um, you know, really, again, kind of circling back into the the learning organization, um, not only learning as an individual, as a group, um, as a leadership team as well. We um, brought in Dr. Lewis, who's a a, a fantastic 
um, professor out at the University of Virginia to talk about courageous conversations, um, continuing to build on the work that was done with our community facilitator and really how that leads into a culture within an organization of, you know, it's, it's DEI is diversity, equity, inclusion, and then the next step is belonging and creating a, a an organization of belonging for um, for anybody who's interested in this line of work and, and really having more representation on our department to attract more um, more uh, recruits coming into our organization from our from our upper, underrepresented groups. So there's a lot of work that's going on. Um, that we have here. Um, again, we're not we're not perfect. We haven't uh, we're not we haven't crossed the finish line. But um, I, I take a lot of pride in our leadership group and our organization um, continuing to push into these difficult conversations and uh, these and look for you know seeking out these courageous conversations with staff and getting them involved in this work. So one last question. I keep. Um kind of joint going over the line from director to just calling you Jason. Um, if somebody wanted to talk further, what would be their next step if they wanted to reach out to you? Yeah, uh, Jason's fine. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, my information is available um, on our website and, uh, and uh, Vivian, if you want to send it out, you're welcome to. We've, we've touched on a lot of topics here. I've done a lot of talking. Um, if I've said anything that that hit anyone in a funny spot um, that they want to know more about or um, they had some questions about, um, I'm available to be uh, and be happy to, to meet with anybody for coffee and, uh, and just have a conversation if, if that's if that's the preferred um, method. But, you know, the if there are things that we're also missing as an organization, you know, I talked a lot about the things that we're working on um, that, you know, we've developed and a lot of those have been in concert with some of our different groups. But um, this is um, a group that um, I haven't spoken to before, and I don't know that we've had um, interactions from our from our police department with um, in terms of providing this type of information. So if there's things that um, we're missing that are suggestions, ideas you have to to further continue our mission um, as an organization and, and how we can better provide um, increase our service model. Um, I'd love to hear from you. Great. Thank you, Jason. It has been a delight to have you with us this evening. I know we're running over a little bit, but I'm going to turn it back over to, to Betsy and really, really, really appreciate you being here tonight. Thank you very much. Thank Betsy? you very much. It's been great having you, uh, Jason. I, oops, I should <clears throat> not just say Jason. <laughs> Jason's fine. <laughs> um, I went to, I attended the Citizens Academy a number of years ago, and it was really great um, learning some of the things about the um, public safety department at that time. And um, it's really, I think, um, I echo your statement about being proud. I think, I think we can be proud of our uh, public safety department. And the other thing I wanted to say is I'm glad it's called a public safety department and not necessarily the police department. In fact, I wish I wish all police departments were called peace officers instead of police officers, because really that's to me what you're all about is keeping our uh, community safe and um, uh, providing a peaceful environment for us. And I really love your learning organization uh, culture. I think it's really critical. Uh, so uh, thank you so much uh, for taking time out of your busy schedule and for being here this, uh, this evening. Uh, as we close, I just want to mention some great things that are coming up for us. Um, in March, we also have another public event uh, with Amy Hong. Uh, she's going to be call, uh, talking about the state of water in South Washington County. Um, and I also want to mention it's not too late to contribute to our fundraiser, not fund, but our fundraiser, um, where our goal is $5,500 and we're already at $3,800, which is just fabulous. Um, we've also got um, a new member coffee on March 18th. 
Uh, and then our book club uh, is on March 25th. We're looking to, for volunteers for the Woodbury Expo on April 1st. So a lot of things coming up. Um, again, uh, thank you so much for speaking with us this evening. And um, Jason, and it's just been uh, great having you. Um, I know we've all learned a lot um, about the inner workings of our public safety department. Good evening and thank you to all who've attended and uh, have a great rest of the day, evening.